uh, Crystal asked me this morning, she hardly ever asks me, but she asked me this morning, she said, what are you preaching on today? I said, the second coming of our Lord. She said, you preached on that last Sunday. <laughs> I said, really? <laughs> As if I forgot, you know. <laughs> but I want to share a part two this morning of a continuation of our message last Sunday. There's so much that can be said about the coming of our Lord. And it is very important to us. It's very important to you as a child of God, but it is very important to you as a sinner to know the Lord is soon returning. Last week our scripture text was taken from Matthew 24 and 44 where Jesus said, Therefore be ye also ready for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. We talked about being ready. We talked about readiness as an attitude toward His return. We talked about Readiness as the state of being fully prepared. We spoke about the awareness of the signs of the time and how Jesus compared it to the days of Noah. We talked about the scripture that says, Let your loins be girded and your lights burning. We talked about the readiness of the minute men during the Revolutionary War. And we spoke about the Gideon's 300 that was chosen out for their readiness and awareness attitude. But I want to focus today a little deeper, if we can, on just what Jesus was saying. Just what he meant when he said, be ye also ready. It's, it's, more, it's more in depth than just having our natural eyes focused towards the eastern sky. You know, you can, from the time you wake up every morning to the time you lay down, you can gaze towards the eastern skies. That don't mean you're ready for the return of the Lord. That doesn't mean you're ready. There's so much more in depth that Jesus was referring to. There is more than just the fellowship of the church. Some people hung around Jesus for the loaves and the fishes. They were not true disciples. Having the fellowship of the church and, and being around at functions and on Sunday mornings and doesn't mean you're ready for the return of the Lord. It's more than membership. It's more than having your name on the roll. More than being a member of the CPMA. Amen. All of this is great. It does not mean you are ready for the return of the Lord. To be ready is more than just the knowledge of the Word of God. There's a lot of people who has a lot of knowledge, more than I'll probably ever contain about this Word. Knowledge. Even the discernment of times does not mean you are ready. Amen? But all of this is leading up to a fact that I want to say, Jesus said, be ready. Not anything else, but be ready. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, ye have no need that I write unto you of the times and seasons. A lot of people's trying to figure out when the Lord's returning. We spoke about this last Sunday. Paul said, you, you, you don't have any need that I write unto you about that. In other words, you don't, you don't need to try to figure that out. But Paul said, be ready. He went on to say, watch and be sober. Be sober, not just, not just thinking on it, not just looking for it, and, but there's more to being ready. Paul said, watch and be sober. He went on 
to say pray without ceasing. This is what's going to get us ready. Uh, see, Jesus was referring to the spiritual aspect of being ready when he said, be ye also ready. I want you to, if you will, imagine with me a swim meet. How many knows what a swim meet is? I asked you hit the nail on the head. I hope everybody heard Laura this morning. I want you to imagine, if you will, a, with me, a swim meet. A specific time designated, a specific day, a specific group of people shows up, and they all got on the same apparel, the swim apparel, their little goggles and their caps, and they all looked apart. And they all watching the clock, knowing what time that the starter is going to fire the pistol. And they, they all show up and they all get on the edge of the pool there and they, they get their toes on the mark. And they all get in their stance and they're looking around and they're ready. You ever watched it? And they're ready. And then I want you to imagine the starter firing the pistol. And many diving into the pool. And I want you to, if you will, imagine with me some stand on the edge of the pool looking around as many others have dove in. They looked the part. They were at the right place at the right time. But they were not fully ready. Why? Because if you will... Indulge me here. Those who remained there had no swimming experience. They did not know how to swim. In fact, they were afraid of the water. One of those would have been me, bro. I don't know how to swim. I could have put on my goggles and my cap and I could have walked up to the line and I could have been there like all the rest of them. But when the pistol was fired... You know where I would have been? I would have been left standing right there. Crystal can tell you probably every brethren in here could not have thrown me into that pool. <laughs> Why? Because I got a little fear of water. I have no swimming experience. Jesus said, be ready. And he was not just talking about showing up. He was not just talking about hanging out with the swim team. But he said, be ready. Amen. It's going to take something for us to be fully ready. Amen. Huh? You pray for me this morning. We're going to get somewhere here in a minute. I want us to hear and I want us to feel the depth and the urgency as Christ admonishes us to be ready. We talked last week, this means to be fully ready. Prepared. Some of these swimmers were not fully prepared. They looked the part. They, they was they at the right place. They showed up in all of their apparel. But they had no swimming experience. So when the others dove in at the sound of the pistol, they were left standing there looking like professional swimmers. In order to be ready on resurrection morn, the Spirit of God must be fully operating in our lives. Oh, yeah. mm. Must be fully operating in our lives for us to be ready, for us to be fully prepared. There is something spiritually that's going to take place at the sound of the trumpet. It's not going to be just a gathering of everybody that looks the part. It's not going to be everybody showing up and, and arm in arm. <laughs> but there's something spiritual that's going to take place there when the trumpet sounds. Yeah. The Word tells us the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Yeah. Huh? That same Spirit, the Word tells us, it will quicken your mortal bodies. Huh? 
the same Spirit. What happened the morning of resurrection morning when the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God, re-entered the body of Christ and He was risen from dead. From death. The grave clothes were left laying there. Huh? But something spiritual took place. The Spirit of God raised him up. The Spirit of God rolled the stone back. Hmm? And the Spirit of God allowed him to walk out of the tomb. Right? What else took place in his ascension? The Spirit of God caused him to lose gravity. As he arose and ascended up into the heavens. There was one thing. The Spirit of God. Jesus said, be ready. This same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will quicken our mortal bodies. Huh? Now, you say, Brother Clint, that's talking about when you're saved. That's talking about when the Holy Ghost moves and, and, and you feel it, 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 it coming all over you and we shout and, and, and we speak in tongues. You're right. It is referring to that. It will quicken you right here. How many has ever felt the quickening power of the Holy Ghost? Huh? Thank God. But let me tell you something else. On resurrection morning, <laughs> when the trumpet sounds, that is what will cause you to lose gravitation. Nothing else. I don't care how much knowledge of the Word you have. You can study to your old man on when Jesus is coming back. But unless you have the Spirit of God, you will not be ready. You will not be ready. You will not be fully prepared. Only the Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 15 and 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. Now listen to this. We shall not all sleep. What does this mean here? We're not all going by way of the grave. Some of us may live to be a hundred. <laughs> We're not all going to sleep. Paul said, let me explain a mystery to you. You're not all going to die. Huh? But he says, but we shall all be changed. Huh? We shall all be changed. Oh, it's going to be something to witness the Spirit of God raising those who are dead in Christ, who have been buried six feet below this earth in a vault, in a, in a casket. We'll not hold them. The, the earth will burst open and they will come forth. That's going to be something for us to witness. I'm talking about some power that's going to take place. Uh, I'm talking about a great manifestation of the power of the Holy Spirit of God. But he says, we all shall be changed. You're not going to leave this earth the way you are right now. This old body ain't going. There better be something breathing in you. <laughs> there better be the Spirit of God breathing in you. That's the only thing that's going to get your feet off of the ground. We shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised. Incorruptible. And we shall be changed. Yes. Nothing corrupt is going to enter heaven. Nothing corrupt will leave this earth in the rapture. Those who are dead and buried, and that body has rotted and wasted, and the worms have consumed it, is corruptible. But they're going to be changed. They're going to raise up incorruptible. But the Bible says we are going to be changed also. It says this immortality 
must put on, or, or, or this mortality must put on immortality. There's going to be a change take place. Just as that dead body in the ground will not go in the rapture, you who are alive and remain will not go in the rapture as you see me. Huh? Mm-mm. <laughs> We're going to be changed. <laughs> the Spirit of God is going to change us and it's going to happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. It can't even be measured. Jesus said, be ready. Huh? What does this mean? There better be a Spirit of God huh? who has residence, who has full power, who has full liberty operating in your life that you can be ready in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, that you will be changed into uh, immortality. That's what he's talking about. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. This is what Jesus is talking about, being ready. Huh? Many, many think that they're ready. First Thessalonians 4 and 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Verse 17 is what I want to focus on. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Those who are dead in Christ are dead in Christ. Those who are dead without Christ are dead without Christ. There's no changing, nothing there. Ever so, 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 however a tree falls, that's so shall it lie. But you and I this morning, we have hope. When the dead in Christ hear that trumpet and are raised up, Paul says, we're going to be caught up. Will you say caught up with me? Caught up. Let's say it again. Caught up. Let's say it again. Caught up. What does that mean? It means snatched away in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, you're going to be snatched just as those graves burst open. Huh? Just as those graves burst open, you're going to be snatched away. There must be something operating in your life. There won't be any time there for prayer meeting. There won't be any time for repentance. There won't be any time to say, Oh, Lord Jesus. But in the twinkling of an eye, we're going to be snatched away. Jesus said, Be ready. You you don't have any time to waste. He could come before I finish this message. He could come at any moment. Be ready. Be fully prepared. The Spirit of God must be fully operated in your life at the sound of the trumpet for you to make it. I want to speak for a minute or two, if I can, this morning on holiness. And this is where this message last week and this second part here, this is where it all stemmed from and I've been trying to direct all of this thought towards this topic. Holiness. How many believes in holiness? We have three. (laughs) Four. Now five. Now six. Holiness. I want to speak on holiness, and I want to speak on the world's take or the world's thoughts. On holiness. 
To start with, we must look at their thoughts of sin. To start with, man's thoughts. Even in the religious world, man has redefined sin. You hear what I say? They have redefined sin. Something that was sin a decade ago, they say it's not sin anymore. Something that was an abomination in the eyes of just good moral people. When I was a child, now they don't even bat an eye. They have redefined sin. Even the religious world. Why? To accommodate their membership. To accommodate their salaries, their, their tithes, their offerings. The religious world has redefined sin. <clears throat> it is viewed as normal, acceptable behavior. When I was a child, and I'm not that, I'm not that old. I'm, I'll be 54 here in a few months. When I was a child, if you were gay or homosexual, you kept it covered up. Why? Because you were ridiculed, you were made fun of, you were not accepted. I'm talking about the world that I have lived in. Huh? No, if you were gay, you didn't want anybody to know it. Because it was classified as one of the most disgusting sins that existed. I'm talking about in the eyes of the world. Now, it's considered normal behavior. Now, it is accepted in the lifestyles of the religious world. Hmm? Now, many people commit sin thoughtlessly. You know, just their everyday life. They're, they're so used to sinning, they don't even give it no thought that they're committing sin. They're just, I work with a boy, he's so engulfed in sin, he just, he, he don't even realize things he's saying and his actions, and he, he's just so engulfed in sin. They commit sin thoughtlessly. Some laugh at it. And many are even entertained by sin. It's so now that you can't turn the TV on. We have three channels and we can't hardly watch any of them. <laughs> yeah. Every little sitcom you see, every little new program, every up-to-date thing, they're picturing sin. They're promoting sin. They're laughing at sin. <coughs> Where once they would have run them out of town on a rail, now they're laughing with them. Now they're being entertained. Huh? Sin. They have redefined sin. Therefore, their thoughts and their acknowledgement of holiness diminishes more and more every day. I'm talking about holiness. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit of God. Every day, this world, more and more, even their acknowledgement of holiness exists, is darkened more and more every day. This world will tell you, you can't live holy. No one can live holy. If you proclaim you can live holy, then they'll ridicule you. Oh, holier than thou. You know, they proclaim holiness cannot exist. You cannot live holy. They will say you can't live without sin. They will say no one is perfect. Huh? You can't live a perfect life. That's the message that this world 
they have redefined sin and they have redefined holiness that it cannot exist. Our general Sunday school coordinator, anybody know her? I'm not going to mention any names. She said in our general assembly this year, some will say I'm no saint. Her response to that was, why not? Hmm? Oh, you don't hear that every day, do you? Why not? The holiness still exists. <laughs> holiness still exists. The Spirit of God still exists. Oh, so many are want, they're quick to say, well, I'm no saint. I'm, you know, I'm not perfect. You know, even Paul said he, he, it wasn't as though he already attained. He was pressing. But he did say this, I have fought a good fight. <laughs> I have kept the faith. There is a crown laid up for me. Uh, if you feel like you can't live holy, if you feel like you can't live perfect, if you feel like you'll never be a saint, our Sunday school coordinator says, why not? Why not? Huh? Why not? I want to I wanna follow up. I want to support her in this statement that she has made here. And maybe I'll get to it in a minute. Although your lifestyles around you may change. I've seen many changes in my few short years on this earth. Haven't you? The lifestyles. Although they may change. Although your own, your own opinion of sin and holiness may change. <laughs> huh? It's changed. Many people's changing their opinion on holiness. Although you may change your own opinion, God's Word says, I am the Lord. I change not. <laughs> you may change your ideas of holiness. God said, I change not. Uh, we heard this morning, He's not a negotiator. <laughs> Oh, what he says, he means. Yeah. What he means, he says. Yeah. Uh, he yeah. says, I change not. Right. Holiness has not changed. Yeah. Not one iota has holiness changed. Yeah. Sin in the eyes of God has not changed. Right. Holiness is not a denomination. Right. Amen. Did you know that? Holiness is not a denomination. This is just a, a title that man has placed on a few different churches, has categorized them, although they're diverse doctrines. If they speak in tongues or if they believe on Pentecost, they want to throw them all in a bucket and say they, they belong to the holiness. That's not what holiness is. Holiness is not a denomination. God never invented denominationalism. Uh-uh. In the eyes of God, it does not exist. Right. Holiness is not a denomination. Holiness is a way of life. I say holiness is a way of life for the individual brought about by sanctification. You know why the world has problems understanding holiness? They ain't sanctified. They don't know the sanctifying power of the blood of Jesus. That's what holiness is. Don't throw me in a pot with all these other churches out here just because we speak in tongues. Oh, y'all church, oh, y'all holiness, right? Yeah, we are, but it's not because we have anything in common with these. <laughs> I might get some feedback from that one, might not. Yeah. Holiness is a way of life for you yeah. and for you yeah. and for you yeah. who are sanctified holy by the blood of Jesus. Yeah. That's what brings holiness. Yeah. <laughs> we serve a holy God. John saw a vision. Now I want you to listen to this in Revelation chapter 4. John saw a vision of God's throne. The visions that were revealed to John 
Some of them were visions of things that had already happened. That passed. Some of them were visions of the present. Things that were happening in that day that John received the vision. And some of the visions were visions of future. Things that was going to happen. The Bible says things which must be hereafter. When you see that, it's referring to things that happen immediately following the rapture of the bride of Christ. This is what John saw. Things that must be hereafter. He saw God's throne. (laughs) He saw God's throne immediately after the rapture of the church. And he saw those around the throne. You know what they were saying? Holy, holy, holy. <laughs> Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. The past of visions, the present visions and the future visions. He was holy. He is holy. And he always will be holy. But John saw this as what was taking place right after the rapture. He saw them around the throne. You know what's going to be going on if you make it to heaven? You'll be around the throne crying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. God has not changed. He was holy at the beginning. He's holy now and He will always be holy. Oh, resurrection morning. Oh, rapture morning. It will take an individual who is walking and living a holy life (laughs) that the Spirit of God is moving in their life. That's what will cause you to lose gravitation from the pull of this old earth. Uh, That's what will break you away from the gravitation of this earth trying to keep you here. It will only be a holy Spirit of God within you. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 7. God hath not called us unto uncleanness. How many serves an old, unclean, vile, hypocritical God? How many serves Him? Uh uh-uh. uh. We serve a holy God. He hath not called us unto uncleanness. He has called us unto holiness. Huh? He has called us unto holiness. God is holy. And you have a calling on your life to be holy. Nothing else will be accepted. Verse 8 says, He therefore that despises, you know a lot of people despise you even talking about holiness. They don't like to hear holiness. Many people will despise that. But it says, He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us His Holy Spirit. He's given us His Holy Spirit. Oh, you can despise holiness all you want to. You're not despising me. You're despising God. He's given us His Holy Spirit. Now listen to this. Leviticus 11 and 45. Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Uh, Sister Crystal, Brother Nick this morning, they've been talking about negotiating. Ain't no negotiating holiness. There's no debating it. It's not up for vote uh, to see how we have to change our opinion on holiness because of the membership. Uh uh. Now, God Almighty said, Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. We are called unto holiness. We've been given His Spirit, His Holy Spirit. So now, Back to Sister Marlowe's thought. Why not? Huh? Why, why aren't you holy? Why aren't you holy? 
We serve a holy God. He's called us unto holiness. He's even given us His Spirit of holiness. Amen. Huh? Why do you want to proclaim, oh no, not me, I can't live, uh-uh. No. Why not? Huh? Why not? We serve a holy God, don't we? <laughs> do we not serve a holy God? <laughs> Has He not called us? His Word said He called us unto holiness. Yeah. It says He's even given us His Holy Spirit. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Amen. The same Spirit. Yeah. <laughs> it will quicken your mortal bodies. Yeah. If it exists, if it's there, yeah. that's what's going to take place. Yeah. God is the existence of holiness. By Him we are called to be holy. He's given us His Holy Spirit. He's empowered us to be holy. Corinthians tells us not, even, not, not just so as much that we should be holy, but Corinthians tells us perfect holiness in the fear of God. Not only has God called you unto holiness, but His Word tells you perfect it. Perfect holiness in the fear of God. You know why some of us not living holy lives? We, we have no fear of God anymore. This world has lost their fear of God. They've redefined sin. They've redefined holiness. And they have no fear. They've changed God. They've attempted to change Him. They've changed him in their mind. And you know what's happened? God's turned them over to reprobates. Huh? Read Romans. I'm not going to go into it. Romans chapter 1, I believe, along verse 21 out there, I think. Read the rest of that chapter. Paul will tell you about a group of people who chose no longer to recognize God as being God. God turned them over to reprobates. They did so much that was inconvenient to them. Huh? Why? Because they tried to make God something. He wasn't. You're not going to do it and get by. Jesus is coming soon. The only hope you have of leaving this earth in the rapture is that there is a Holy Spirit of God that dwells in you that will quicken you when the trumpet sounds. <laughs> the Spirit of God today. <laughs> we better learn how to feel and be sensitive to the Spirit of God today because in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, that's the only hope you will have is that the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in you. <laughs> I want you to stand with me. I want to do something this morning. You know, the Lord has ways of revealing things. I know this morning, as pastor of this church, God has moved in ways to reveal things to me. <laughs> that make me special? No, it makes me scared to death. <laughs> but I want to say to you this morning, I know there are some who need to be in this altar this morning. <laughs> you don't need fear me. There ain't much I can do to you. But you better find some fear of God. There are some in this place this morning who needs to be in an altar of repentance. Am I going to come to you and pull you out? No, you don't have to worry about that unless God tells me to. No, that's just not how... I'm not, I don't have that kind of makeup unless God tells me to. But I tell you one thing. God has revealed things to this pastor. And I share it with you this morning because I am put here to watch over your souls. 
I don't want you to go to hell and be able to say, Brother Pulliam never told me. I don't want you to end up in hell and tell everyone else there he didn't care anything about me. That's not so. I want us all to go to heaven. I want us to find the grace of God that we'll be ready when the trumpet sounds. If you're here this morning, if you will bow your heads with eyes with me, if you need a touch from God,